And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Brad Kessler's novel, Birds in Fall, won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. His other books include Lick Creek and The Woodcutter's Christmas, and most recently, North. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Nation, The Kenyan Review, and Bomb, as well as other publications. He is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and the Rome Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, please welcome Brad Kessel. Hi, everyone. Can, how's the sound? Good. Thanks for coming out on this balmy evening. And thanks, Chris. Um, I'm, I'm looking for something in my pocket called a pen. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm going to just read um, uh, two or three short sections just to kind of set us up, and then we could open it up to conversation, questions, dialogue. Um, this book uh, it came out about a year ago, and it's 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 the encounter of these th of three characters. One is uh, who will meet. Um, one is Father Christopher, who's a reluctant abbot at a monastery set in a fictional Vermont uh, monastery, and um, the other character is Saro Abdi Muse, who is a young Somali woman who has made her way from the Horn of Africa, uh, the, back, the back door through S South America and up through Central America and Mexico to the US border where she's detained and uh, brought to a detention center in New York City and um, is let out after a, a year and a half and then um, is fleeing north to Canada right after the, the 2016 election. Uh, afraid that she will be deported. And she's on her way to Canada uh, illegally when we meet her uh, in the book. And the third character is, is Teddy Fletcher, who's a Vermonter, uh, who's a disabled veteran uh, who fought in the wars in Afghanistan. And we're going to meet him right now. And um, I'm just going to read a bit. <clears throat> Teddy knew the monastery roads practically in his sleep. All 15 miles of asphalt and switchback that climbed from the valley 3,000 feet to the top. He'd been repairing the private road long before he ever had a driver's license, patching potholes with his father each summer. He knew every ditch and culvert and where the frost heaves formed. <coughs> Since his return, he'd slipped back into the way of life he recalled from his childhood. The monks in their cream-colored habits, their hoods and bells, the quiet rhythm of their days. The weight of the weather in the North Country proved a kind of ballast. It grounded Teddy in ways he'd forgotten before his return. He liked the ocean outside San Diego, but never felt at home in Southern California. He'd missed the New England weather, the mushroomy smell of the woods. He'd accepted Father Christopher's offer on a trial basis at first. Two years earlier, when he left Walter Reed, he wasn't sure he'd ever get behind a wheel again. It wasn't so much the new leg or the pain, but the sudden terror that sometimes seized him on the road, a white pickup rushing past, a trash bag fluttering on the shoulder, a man standing on a highway overpass. Anything could set him into a spiral. A blast of wind shook the Ford, the cab shuddered, snow shot into headlights, Teddy kept a steady hand on the joystick, feathering the plow, feeling the depths of the new snow. They were entering the falls now, the flakes fatter, wetter, mixed with rain, the sky a wash of gray. He cracked the window and let in cold air, dawn already arriving. The chains rang on the road, chunk, 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 a reassuring sound, iron on asphalt. At the bottom of the mountain, freezing rain swept across the valley. 
birches bent, encased in snow and ice. Teddy opened his window by the toll house and typed numbers on the frozen pad. Cora rose and sniffed the air while the boom gate lifted across the road. The two-lane two highway beyond lay unplowed. The snow glazed in a sheet of freezing rain. Teddy pulled onto the roadway, ice crunched under the tires. Cora stood on all fours, hackles raised. She let out a low, menacing growl. She'd caught the scent of something on the air, a fox or cat, maybe a moose or bear out of hibernation. Ice pinged off the windshield. Then Cora exploded into barks and lunged at the glass. Teddy's face went pale. A person stood on the highway in the, in the sleet, a small figure in a yellow raincoat. Cora howled and pawed the dash. Teddy slowed and braked. Who'd be outside in the middle of nowhere in an ice storm? Had it not been for the dogs barking, Teddy might have believed he was seeing a ghost. So I'm going to fast forward. It's later that night, and um, this is now we're uh, from the Abbott's point of view. <clears throat> the spring night passed on Blue Mountain. It's May, by the way. May. It's a, it's a freak sto snowstorm in, in early May in 2017. The spring night passed on Blue Mountain. The temperature moderated each hour. The moon went down at 2. The monks all slept in their cells in narrow beds built into the walls, in rooms of birch and pine. Brother Bruno and Anselm, Father Tiard and Ramon, Simon, Jonah, and John, Brother Benison, David, Luke, Min. Each monk had arrived at Blue Mountain over the decades from near and far, from California, Da Nang, Rio, Kansas, and Queens, from Boston, Zurich, Cincinnati, and San, Diego, San Juan. Each man had been drawn to the monastery for his own mysterious reasons, metal filings to a larger magnet. They slept now in their cells, each beneath blankets, soundly asleep, as the May night passed overhead, all except for Father Christopher, who alone lay awake long after midnight, unable to sleep. So much had happened in the past 18 hours, he hadn't had the time to process it during the day. He lay in bed now, turning over Teddy's call earlier that evening, about the women's Honda, the warning notice from the state police. When he'd gone to the guest house after, the gray-haired woman insisted she leave right away. It was no longer safe, she said, for her to stay. Someone from Canada would come in a day or so to pick up the Somali woman when she was more fit to travel. In the meantime, the young woman could recover there in the guest house, the driver suggested, under Christopher's vigilance and care. Christopher didn't know what to say. He kept thinking of the three strangers who appeared by the oaks in Mamre in the heat of a summer day, Abraham returning to meet them and falling at their feet, the curds and milk, the calf and bread. How could he turn the visitor away? Yet now, at night, in the dark of his room, he felt the full weight of his decision. The safety and care of the young stranger lay in his hands. What if she didn't get better? What if something more serious was wrong, or he was breaking the law by harboring her? He'd have to deal with Brother Bruno and come clean with the rest of the community. Bruno had given him 24 hours. Half that time had already passed. He'd have to call a community meeting in the morning. There was no hiding the young woman anymore. He'd have to tell them all who she was and where she was from. He knew he wouldn't sleep that night. He rose and put on a robe and powered the PC on his desk. Ever since he'd seen the young woman asleep in Edward's bed, the image stayed with him, her body beneath the blankets, the stranger, a black woman, African, Muslim, the fact of her body in the old abbot's room both troubled and intrigued him, the mystery of it all. How else did she end up on Blue Mountain in Edward's old bed if not by providence. Christopher sat in the gray glow of the computer and typed words into the search engine. He knew nearly nothing about Somalia, the country and culture, its people or food. He didn't even know what language Somali spoke. 
He sat now and began to educate himself online, scanning everything he could find related to Somalia. He read about a country of nomads and traders, an ancient Cushitic people who herded camels and goats, who sailed dhows across the Arabian Sea clockwise from their coast to Aden, then Bombay, and back home with the winds all in one season. He read about Europe dividing the country, Italy seizing the south, England the north, the colonizers exploiting clan divisions and making everything a lot worse, ethnic Somalis in the north, Somali Bantu in the south, Darud and Huwaya, Deir and Isak. He learned about the actions or inactions of his own Roman Catholic church in Mogadishu, the forced labor they ignored or encouraged. He read long into the dark about Somalia's independence, its heyday, the gradual and swift collapse of the country, the foreign armies, the American invasion and pullout, the U.S. support of warlords, the CIA's involvement, the promise of oil. He took it all in, extraordinary rendition, the black sites, the global war on terror. And the deeper he read, the more he discovered not only about Somalia, but his own unhidden history. For it was all there to see, his complicity and the overlapping of their lives. He inside a cloister on a mountain in New England, she from halfway around the world. Weren't they part of the same system, no matter how separate each seemed on the surface? Didn't he, Christopher Gathro, benefit from the same bloody history from which he drew his livelihood? Rome and its violent past, the US and its more recent plunder? It was easy to pretend otherwise in the cloister, to live inside their own bubble, inside a dream of their own autonomy, invested in tunics and robes. The problem with living inside a bubble was how easily it could be popped. Every outsider was, potentially, a pin. The year before he made his simple vows, Christopher's sister had asked him, wouldn't it be better for him to use his faith to actually help others or provide a service for the poor? He told her back then that monks did help others, that the monastery was a lighthouse to all. He quoted Thomas Merton and compared the cloister to a power plant and explained that contemplative monks and nuns were like unseen engineers, sending out invisible currents of prayer, keeping the planet in sync. In the economy of the spirit, he was serving others all the time. His sister just rolled her eyes. Yet her question stayed with him still, as it did with most monks he knew. The contradictions of monastic life could never be fully squared. The mystery and faith, the doubt and belief. There were two sides of the same coin. You can never have one without the other. He typed new words into Google, Somali recipes, and scrolled through pages of popular dishes, sambusas, congiro, Basto, Somali rice, and goat. What could he bring the young woman in the morning to give her comfort, to make her feel less alone? Somali bread was called kanjiro, or anjiro, or sometimes lahuk. It was basically the same, he read, as Ethiopian, anji as Ethiopian injira, the spongy flatbread, the pancakes Christopher had sometimes eaten in Soho when he lived in New York City. Perhaps he could make her Somali bread, Kanjiro, drizzled with honey, or maybe even maple syrup, a simple gesture, bread. He read multiple recipes. The monastery kitchen had no teff flour, no sorghum or millet, but he found one that called for other flours instead and sent the pages to his printer. Downstairs in the kitchen, he gathered ingredients from the larder, white flour, wheat flour, cornmeal, a bottle of yeast from the walk-in, warm water, sugar to start the yeast. It was almost four in the morning now, dark in the kitchen windows. The bells for vigils would toll in 50 minutes. He followed the recipe by the light over the stove, sifting flowers into a ceramic bowl, adding the wet ingredients to the dry. Now he had to wait, according to the recipe, and let the mixture ferment for at least 24 hours, or 48 even better. The dough needed time to sour, and bubble before it could be baked on a hot skillet. 
He covered the bowl with a dish towel. He looked around the kitchen. Where could he keep the bowl warm enough but out of sight? He didn't want Brother Benison finding it and asking any questions. He put away the flowers, stored the yeast, washed the counters, and scrubbed his hands. He cradled the covered bowl in his arms and shut off the lights. He'd bring the bowl upstairs to his study and set it on, in a sunny window. There it would keep warm throughout the day and overnight. By then, he'd have called the community meeting, and all the monks would be aware of the young woman in the guest house. By then, all would be revealed. The mixture soured, the fermentation started, then the real baking could begin. So um, I could read another chapter, but I think I'm going to leave it at that. I, there, I could read a short sorrow chapter, um, but maybe it would be better if we talked. Maybe one more section. Okay. <laughs> I'll read, a, I'll read, um, okay, I'll read a, a section where we're following sorrow in... Um, this happens later in the book where we're getting sorrows. As Saro is in the guest house recovering from th this crash and her sickness uh, from this, the cold, we're getting her backstory the whole time. And so um, here's a chapter when she's in Central America moving slowly north. <clears throat> she, mo she moved through countries whose names she barely knew. Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras. She traveled alone by truck, cab, minivan, on foot, in combis and school buses, and even once a donkey cart. She tried to put the Darien Gap behind her, but she was always looking for Delmar, asking anyone and everyone at each migrant stop or hostel, had anyone seen a man fitting his description? She couldn't not hope that her cousin was still alive, somewhere on the road just a few steps ahead of her. She dressed <clears throat> in baggy jeans, a loose shirt, and wore her hair hidden inside a feed cap, yet still drew attention by her look, her body language, and foreignness, things she couldn't hide. Men still grabbed and children shouted. She rarely responded. It was easier to say nothing, to be an enigma, to act deaf and dumb. One morning in the capital, Tegucigalpa, she brought three razor blades for a few centavos from a vendor in the street. In the public bathroom at the bus station, she borrowed a hand mirror from the female attendant and locked the bathroom stall door behind. She ran the razor through her hair, close to her scalp, cutting one clump off at a time. She watched hair fall to the bathroom floor, wavy and thick, as she had once before, the willow, the tomboy. Afterwards, she took a torn t-shirt and wrapped her chest and dressed again and looked in the bathroom mirror, satisfied. When she walked out of the bathroom that day into the Centro Comercial in Tegucigalpa, she felt instantly invisible. Another black-skinned boy in a feed cap. She could have been Garifano or Creole, another unknown body moving through the streets of Central America most assumed she spoke Spanish. She got used to hiding in plain sight, not speaking on the road, to the sounds of unknown words washing over her without comprehension or the desire to comprehend. She moved through the days with a singular purpose, a dozen miles here and there, each night a bridge she had to cross till morning. Her needs made minimal, a pastelito or tamal from a roadside stand, she subsisted on whatever was easy to find, rice and beans, an ear of roasted corn, a boiled egg, water begged or brought. Sometimes she ate nothing for days. Avoiding the interests of others became her goal. She learned to move like a shadow, ungraspable, pray in silence, make herself minute, curled up the way insects did under rocks in the scrublands, her shell of nonchalance. It was better to be mute, to say nothing, to volunteer nothing. She opened her mouth only to eat and pray. In Guatemala, she watched the other migrants and learned how to leap off a bus before a checkpoint or border crossing, 
how to hike a few hours and return to the road further on. She watched and listened and trusted no one. By the time she reached the border of southern Mexico, she was mostly sinew and bones. She looked lean and haggard with her shaven head and clothes stiff with sweat and salt, baggy trousers held up with a rope. She wore a button-down shirt and a blue vinyl jacket she'd picked up along the way, the blue agar feed cap and bottle slung over a shoulder. The rougher she looked, the more she was left alone, protected by her filth, her reeking clothes. She no longer needed to worry about oiling her hair or braids. It was so much easier being a boy, thin and sullen, dangerous looking, always traveling alone or with one or two other migrants, always lowering her voice or not speaking at all and stepping away from the others and standing at a distance, pretending to pee, holding her imaginary penis, only to relieve herself later alone. If trouble came, she had her knife, and now a razor too, tethered to a stick, tucked inside her pants. It goes on. <laughs> so, um, so those are the three characters, and, and the book is um, what happens when these very separate lives uh, intersect. I'd be happy to entertain questions or um, <clears throat> uh, how did I come up with the main characters? Um, so I live um, in Bennington County, in near the town of Arlington, and we live by. Uh, we're neighbors of the Carthusian, the only Carthusian monastery in the United States, and they're uh, one of the oldest monastic Catholic orders. So we hear their bells in the evening, and uh, we don't see them, and they don't allow any guests up there. Um, so I'd always been, I always wanted to write about uh, what it would be like to be a monk, and I always had this fascina fascination with monasteries, and not only do we live next to the Carthusians, but down the road about 20, 30 minutes are, are the, uh, the monks of Nuskeet, if anyone's heard of them. They're uh, the ones who have the art of raising puppies. They, they train German shepherds, so they're Russian Orthodox. So another monk. So wherever you, you can't throw a stick without hitting a monk, <laughs> although they don't come out very often. <laughs> and yeah, they're around. So I, I, I always wanted to, um, to, to, that was, I knew that it was, the book was going to take place at a monastery in Vermont. Um, and into that world, into that sanctuary, I also knew that there was going to be, you know, the other or the foreigner that was coming in. And I started this book long before um, there was ever a Donald Trump presidency. It started back, you know, in the Obama years. Um, but even back then, you know, the refugee crisis was was unignorable, and. Um, and my wife was working, uh, she's a photographer, and she was with a friend of ours who works with Physicians for Human Rights. She was photographing uh, asylum seekers. And so I knew, I knew a lot of their stories. I, I knew maybe the Somali man who, whose, whose story uh, was not unlike Sarah's. And um, so it was the contrast of these two lives of people looking for a kind of sanctuary, one, you know, the religious, um, inside a gated community, literal sanctuary, and, and then um, this woman coming in from, from the outside. And, and it's a, really the story of our country, you know, about gated, we're a big gated community, and who, who we let in and who we let out. So those two were the kind of obvious characters, and into that, and then the, the third character is this, this Teddy Fletcher, um, I felt was also, um, necessary as a, as more like a Vermonter. Um, um, whether it works or not, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Following up on that, how what kind of research did you do to create a sense of place, like the last piece you wrote about coming up through Central America? Yeah. Did you visit 
those places, or was it imagined, or? Right. So um, <clears throat> the, the Vermont sense of place was the easiest, of course, because that's where we live. And, um, and so the, challenge, the biggest challenge was, uh, there were many challenges, but the biggest challenge was, was creating a, um, a Somalia that was believable and true to the, the, the best that I could make it true to what's on the ground. Um, so I'm going to cut out the middle part, which was Central America, where I have traveled, where I have been. Um, and I have been in East Africa. I was in the Sudan, and I lived in Cairo for a while. So, but you never f quite feel right about writing about a place that you don't know intimately. Um, you feel like you're faking it. And so I think a lot of it was faking it, but a tremendous amount of research. Google Earth is a great thing that never existed, you know, before, you know, in, in, in earlier books that I had written where I had to imagine places. So you can go on little journeys now, although Google Earth doesn't like Somalia very much or the Horn of Africa. They don't send their trucks there. <laughs> um, and then talking to people, I mean, and having readers who grew up there who are Somali, that was, that was the one piece that was the hardest to uh, earn the trust of, of a community that has every reason not to trust, you know, a white man from Vermont. Uh, so, you know, we're cobbling that together to, to, to make a plausible sense of place. Well, thanks for um, thanks for the plug. And th um, by the way, there's books for sale, and 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 it leads into um, the 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 um, whatever sales figures that end up being. It goes to the U.S. Committee of Refugees and Immigrants, their Vermont office in Colchester. So, um, but it, the reason why I say that now is is um, um, responding to your question somewhat of a question about why or how the Somali woman and, um, and how hard it was. And it was, and I got it wrong for years. Um, and it wasn't until, um, it wasn't until I met um, a woman who worked for the USCRI in, um, in Colchester and worked specifically with, with a lot of African asylum seekers and particularly with Somali families. <clears throat> that I, I had asked her to read the manuscript as it was, and um, which uh, which she did, and um, she didn't get back to me for a long time, <laughs> which I didn't take as a good sign. But eventually, I pressed her, and she said, "Oh, it's very you know, Sarah. Did you mean her to be a real character or a literary?" She didn't quite say a literary device, but I knew what she was getting at. So. Um, so I said, yes, she's meant to be real. And then she said, well, you, you have a lot to learn. <laughs> and she was very kind about it. And, 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 she, and I had already been up to Burlington a few times and had interviewed uh, a few Somali uh, Vermonters, 
pe people who had come from Somalia who live in Verona. Um, but it wasn't until this woman, Laurie Stavrand, uh, who, who worked, it wasn't until she kind of took me under her wing and started taking me around to people's homes. And everybody trusted her there. And she, she, she had quite a, a good relationship within the community. So it was her and this man, Abdi Rashid Hussein, who is also Somali, who works for USCRI. Um, the both of them helped, took me under their wing, basically, and showed me around. And I started to meet families. And I started to have long, engaged conversations with um, with this one woman in particular, Fardosa Abdullah, who, um, and um, I mean, Laurie had said at the start that she would want, if, if you're going to publish this book, which I wasn't sure about for a long time, because there were these doubts, and it happened right around the time. I don't know if you know about the, the uh, American dirt controversy. And um, so all that was, you know, in, all that was in the atmosphere. And I just thought, and I knew this was trouble going in, that I was overstepping and not staying in my lane and doing all the wrong things. Uh, but I thought, I, is it possible to, to enter another um, you know, body that's not your own? Is it, po is it still possible to even attempt to do that? Um, so it was through, through a lot of hard work and, and spending time and getting the approval of the community, really. And there was a point right when the American Dirt thing was happening when I said to Abdi Rashid, Hussein, I said, I don't know if I want to publish this book right now. I just, uh, and he got visibly, you know, upset. He said, Well, how could you say that? I mean, this is not about you anymore. It's about, you know, these people. Uh, this story that, you know, I knew that this story was going on back in 2014, you know, and of course he was intimately involved in, uh, you know, people from the Horn of Africa coming up through. Quito and Colombia and making their way through the Darien Gap through Central America. That had been going on during the Obama years. But nobody really knew the story. And to me, that was this great epic journey that nobody knew about. I mean, they started to know about it at the end of the Trump, you know, the Trump caravan. And, and then they started to know about it with the, the, you know, the, the refugees under the bridge. But it was this great story that nobody was really telling. And, um, and just the, the perseverance that one had to have to, to leave their homeland, to go to one country and then travel you know, for months to reach a border that you hope to be led into. And then the disappointment when you got there, assuming that you would be welcomed because you were prior to um, you know, the Muslim ban, you could just say, I'm Somali and I'm seeking asylum. I mean, you would have to go through all the hoops, but you weren't automatically detained as you were there. So I don't know if that is a long-winded way of answering. Yeah. Um, I thought on page uh, 196, you sort of summed up that whole, you know, America, this big ideal, and then maybe it's all a sham, mm -hmm. um, which sadly, I think some of us, you know, feel we have become, which is um, a sham and not So the novel takes place in the spring of 2017. And back then, everything was changing very quickly in the asylum and the resettlement world. Um, and I, I can't really speak to the details, but I do know um, that back then, there was a lot of movement up to the northern border by people that were undocumented. And, and last night, I spoke to the United Methodist Church group of Plattsburgh, New York who read the book. And they were very involved. A lot of people in Plattsburgh, New York, were involved with ferrying people up to Roxham Road on the border. Uh, that was one of the, the more reported crossing places where um, people from South Asia or, or China, or you know, all over the world, really, were brought, including Somalis, to then cross over into Canada, where they'd be arrested and then helped by the mounted police and given a bus ticket to Montreal where they had to you know, go to the asylum center. So <clears throat> for a while, I think it was easier. But then Canada, I think, caught up quickly to, to our own politics. And it, it, 
it, I think it became harder. So there was a window, and I remember reading news stories about people crossing in Vermont, people crossing in the Midwest, you know, from Minneapolis up and, and freezing, you know. That winter, there was a time when, when a lot of movement was happening north. Yeah. In 2002, right after 9-11, Salvation Army in Burlington was housing people that were passing through, and um, oh, I had I had called there many many times and said, you know, I can I can come up, I can cook, I can clean, I can whatever, um, and um, and I had thought maybe. If there was somebody of Arabic descent, because that's where my roots were, that you know I could offer offer them something too if they had somebody that just needed like a hot meal or something right. like that. And so this Michelle Janess, I don't know if oh, she, yeah, yeah, you know her. Yeah. So she called and she <laughs> said, "We have a family of three, and could you could you take them? They're from Peru. Do you speak Spanish?" Do you speak? <laughs> you speak Spanish? No. <laughs> Do you have an extra bedroom? No. <laughs> but they came anyway. <laughs> they came anyway. We went and we picked them up, and it was supposed to be for just a couple of days, and it ended up being for almost two months until they could. And they were wonderful, wonderful people. But they were headed for Canada because, and they they are there now. They have citizens. made me is after she made that whole enormous trip and then to be in that room in the detention center with no windows that just and she was there I, I read the book a while ago a year or it was um, a it's about a year and a half I months. just can't even imagine yeah. that how horrific that would be and that she was ever going to recover from that right but I assume that's based on reality yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is the most horrifying thing. Well, and, and, and I, I, I think, think they're also betting on people just giving up. I mean, I think yeah. every day you're given a, do you want to leave? You know, you, all you have to do is. So, yeah. Um, well, first there and then. Oh, I was, I really enjoyed, was interested in the tension in the monastery between <laughs> the monks because um, I was rooting for the abbot. <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah. but um, I thought his wrestling with the challenge and his responsibility and what was legal and what was safe, I, I just thought that tension was really interesting. I don't know if you want to talk about how you built that. Did you talk with monks? I, because that's what we expect of them is to offer sanctuary, yeah. but it was... Um, that. I, I think, think that, that I had this notion at first 
that everybody would be accepting and, oh, they're monks, you know, <laughs> peace, love, and silence. Um, and I don't know if it was one, because I also had, I mean, part of, part of the research I did for this book was, was to spend time in monasteries and to understand what they were doing and to, to, to be comfortable writing sort of from a Christian or Catholic point of view, which I, don't, which I am neither of those things. So, um, <clears throat> so um, I think it was one of, the, I had uh, two kind of informants or people that helped me who were both monks. One was a Trappist um, at Spencer Abbey and, and then uh, a friend who's, who's at Newski. <clears throat> um, they read the manuscript, and it might have been one of them that suggested that a bit of a reality check that uh, it, that you know it's not all we don't all get along so well. I mean, there's a lot of bitterness, there's a lot of um, pettiness. I mean, just like any human society, <coughs> you know, it happens in the monastery, and that's the beauty of the monasteries. They have to work this out. They have to love their neighbor. You know, because they're not family, and they have to. You know, that that's part of the challenge, is not is is living with the others. So, <clears throat> I think that just grew with with successive versions. This guy Bruno, um, and um, yeah, it, it didn't come naturally to me. I had to kind of learn that. Um, yeah. Are you aware of the? Um uh, Benedictine monks in Weston. Yeah. Because I know the states me, but they used to. Yeah, I, I, I actually. I do, I, there's a little call out to them. There's a little. Okay. And there's a little scene here when this conversation is happening in what, what they, they call, call a chapter, chapter meeting. Uh -huh. And the, so this, this, this brother, uh, Bruno, or this, this, this man, Father Tiard, who's against having. Strength, you know, anyone hosting anyone, it's not in their, um, it's, it's, it's not part of what they do. Uh, and he argues, and he, he brings up Weston, or he talks about Weston, because I know that in, in the 80s during the sanctuary movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, Mary has said um, she appreciated the personalities, the conflict among the monks. And you had said uh, also that you don't come from a Christian, or you're not a Christian or a Catholic. You did such a fine job, I thought, and I read it long enough ago that I don't remember a whole lot, but I loved reading about the abbot when he was young and how um, he had a mentor. I loved reading about how he felt about the deceased abbot or whatever. Um, that intrigued me very much. I happened to be raised in the Roman Catholic Church. So a lot of that uh, was more familiar to me than it might have been to someone who uh, you know, didn't grow up like that. But um, I thought you delved into that very well, and it seemed that you were familiar with it. Yeah. So um, kudos to you for that. Oh, well, and I think your prose is beautiful. <laughs> I'm so happy that you read to us because the words came alive, and your voice matches the words, and they just flowed. So I'm really pleased to see about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the Catholic, Catholic, I mean, my wife's Catholic, Catholic. Uh -huh. and you know, I, I lived in Rome. We lived in Rome for, for a year, and, um, and, I've, and that was, a, it, it, there was a lot of learning. There was a lot of learning, and there was, um, uh, and a lot of interest on my part about Catholicism, and and um, even to the point where I thought maybe I need to get maybe I need to get baptized. You know, um, no, it, but I did take I did by mistake or in an act of grace took uh, communion at the Vatican, uh, which which changed my life. I mean that that really made me understand. Well, because I'm a Jew, and so every my whole life has lived in uh, previously had been lived in opposition to Christianity. How did it change your life? Well, I, I understood how powerful. I, I mean, 
the Catholic Church would do a better job if they let everybody have communion because, mm -hmm. because you understand that, you're, that the act is such a beautiful act. You're being fed. Somebody is feeding you. It's like so primal. It's so um, uh, like the Godhead, you know. It's so indigenous in a way that you're being, you're, you're being given. It's a communion. It's a communion. The day I happened upon the Episcopal Church in town, the door was open. You know how these things happen? Yeah, the door's open. I walked in, I wanted to go for a reason, and lo and behold, they were having a mass. Mm -hmm. uh, three people were there aside from the, the pastor. It's Wednesday, I didn't realize they did this. Yeah. Well, uh, who were those? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess the Episcopals know, but <laughs> the door's open. You know, the doors are uh, truly, literally and figuratively, it is. And in the Episcopal Church, I, I agree. And so I walked in, and I, it wasn't at the beginning of the Mass, but of course I participated in communion. Yeah. It's a, in a sense, if, if you have communion in your church, if you have that, that ceremony, there's almost no reason to be in that church unless you go to communion. I mean, go to communion is a funny way of saying it, but that's what it's all about yeah. in those Christian um, Face. Right, so. and so, so what happened to me was it was actually it was December. It was, it was the, the, the first, first night of um, of Hanukkah <laughs> in Rome, and it was a full moon, and we went to an evening. We were at the we just w wandered down, and we were in the Vatican. The, the, the mass was in Italian, and I think I I fell asleep during it, and I woke up, and you know my wife who is Catholic. She was stood, everybody stood in line, and I just stood too. And I just knew I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to do it. And I was kind of in this sort of twilight state, and uh, it, I, did, I received the host, and I, uh, I just broke into, down into tears. I mean, it was. You know, all those people who, who participated in the first mm -hmm. Eucharist? They were Jews, I know. Jews. Yeah. So there you go. No, I know. And, and so I confessed this, you know, I confessed this to, my, to you know, monks, and they were like, oh, well, you were in the state of grace. And, you know, I mean, nobody, nobody gave me a hard time really about it. And it did, it did make me understand, you know, something, you know, that felt very, very deep and primal, yeah. The other thing I was relating to in this book is um, uh, I spent many years in Lewiston, Maine, and I don't know if you've ever been to Lewiston, Maine. It does not look at all like Middlebury, Vermont. Um, and French-Canadian population, and they had a huge influx of Somali refugees mm -hmm. there. Um, and it created quite, um, well, a lot of tension, yeah. um, as you can imagine. And it, you know, it was a dying mill town, and then all these people arrived. And I have been back recently, and on so many levels, it gave the town some new life. New life yeah. um, there's yeah. stores <laughs> all along the main drive, little markets and, and other stores like that. The, um, well, and more importantly, to a lot of people, they won the state championship in soccer with most of the kids on the team being Somali refugees. So um, that was a bigger deal. But um, you know, it, it was interesting to walk around the town that I had lived in many years ago and see all this influence of the refugees that are now there. And much more, oh, not totally, I'm sure, but there is a degree of acceptance now that yeah. there wasn't yeah. 15 years ago. Well, well, one thing, and uh, a kind of belated response to why a woman was that, um, um, I don't know how to say this without sounding awful, but I mean, Somali women are just incredible in terms of, and, and last night during this, this um, Plattsburgh uh, Methodist Church meeting, Lori Stavrand, who works with USCRI, was on it, and she was saying, the Somali women that she works with, that she knows, and the one and people that she introduced me to, are just these powerhouses. I mean, people don't—they're not seen because you know people think they're covered and they're passive. They're seen as passive or they're seen as invisible. And she said, it's quite the opposite. I mean, they—they they are incredibly strong and and advocate, you know, for their families. And and um, she just had nothing. It, it, culturally, they're they're recognized as. Um, just, you know, I incredible what they do, what they manage to do for their for their families and for their community, um, and it's not it's not a perspective that 
we would know, us white people would know about. Um, even if you drive to Burlington and you see someone with, you know, covered up and you'd think, oh, they're, um, whatever, they're being subjected to something or, or they're, they're submissive to their husbands or whatever. I mean, it's quite the opposite. So that's just another piece of it. So, I mean, the, the, the fact that Sarah has the power that she has to go through this, what she's gone through, is, is not something um, purely fictional, you know, an invention. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just um, finish up a little about the ending to the book. Uh, my husband is a big reader and more than I am, and well, we always talk about the, how difficult it is to get to the end of a, of a very involved book. Um, that's satisfying because really in life things don't just like it's not just the end. Um, and I thought you did something really interesting with it because it, I'm, I'm not going to give it away, but <laughs> it wasn't a happy ending and it wasn't a sad ending. And it was it was kind of it was clearly like <coughs> the end of something, but there was you didn't really know where things were going after that. Um, so um, there was a lot of tension. You know, up to that point, like were they going to get to that point? But then they're there, and you still don't really know what's going to happen. And I just wondered, um, kind of, what what did you want the ending to do? Did you want the, is that what you were looking for? And how how did kind of? I just think endings are tricky. Yeah. Um, I, had I had like three different ends, ends to this, and so, so what what's left are two of those endings because there's there is the one ending where with the characters, and then there's the second ending where it's a dream, right? I mean, she's, um, which lends to, to a lot of ambivalence about the future, and I think that's where we're at. So I just, in an earlier version, the third, the third ending that I, that I scrapped was a much more optimistic, and this was maybe prior to Trump, the Trump presidency, <laughs> you know, because I had been working on it that long. And it was when I had Saro, uh, before I got more deeply involved with the Somali community and learned what I was not getting right, I had a more of a fantasy about who this Saro was and about what she wanted. And, 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 um, and it was wrong. I mean, it was like, oh, she wanted to be a poet or she wanted to be a writer. And, that, and there's hints of that in here, but not in the way that I had made the ending. The, 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 the false happy ending that I had in an, an original, in one of the original versions where it's years later and a letter comes and it's a book from Saro. She's published her first chat book. Yeah, and everything is great and isn't it, you know. And it's like, no, that's not where we're really at now. I mean, I did, I did, I did miss having in her book, there was one side in Somali and one side in English. It was translated. So one other thing I should just add is, and, and, the, and why, and this is Vermont Humanities Council is sponsoring this, and um, they're, they've, uh, I've got a grant with them to do what grew out of my encounter with this, with this, the Somali community in Burlington was a project that was tentatively called Deep North, and it's, um, it's oral histories of, of three different um, one of them is this woman, Fardosa, who I mentioned, and her family, and her son, Muhammad. Um, and then there's a man, Shadir Muhammad, who's a Somali Bantu, um, who uh, was a farmer in Somalia, who lives in uh, Winooski now. And the third one is uh, this man, Abdi Hamid Muhammad, who was a nomadic pastoralist. He, he was a nomad. with cam His family were nomads with camels and, and goats. Um, and he lives in Winooski now. So it's the, these three stories that I've, I've, I've been getting their story um, over the last couple of years, and it, it will be a book. Of, uh, and it's their voice, really, or as, as close to their voice as can be. Um, and that's what, um, that's kind of the, the add-on um, to, to this book, in a way. But it's, it's, it's not me. I'm just the handmaid of the book. So that's exciting. To hear those, because their stories are amazing. And if I knew their stories before I wrote this book, I wouldn't have written the book. I would have just, they should just tell the stories and cut me out of it. Yeah. 
So the title and the cover seems like you probably had a lot of different, I don't know if you had, I'd love to hear about the title because I have ideas about North, um, yeah. my husband and I are sailors, so I think about true North. And yeah. Why did you title it North? Um, and your titles are such a pain in the ass. And so it had all sorts of bad titles. Um, and I, I always like, I mean, there's a Seamus Haney uh, collection of poetry called North. And I always like the simplicity. And it is really about where do we go from here? There's only so much North. You know, there's a line in the book about she just keeps on going North to find sanctuary. And she's going to go to the polar ice caps and they're going to melt. I mean, it's really what's happening to the Earth, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> To follow up on the ending question, when you start a novel and have three principal characters, do you have a sense of where they're going to go? They're going to go from A to B to C, or is it stops and starts and more than drafts? And I guess at the end, how do you know it's time to stop? <laughs> yeah. Um, I usually don't know where. I mean, I have maybe scenes in my head of something that might take place. I, I usually don't know where it's going to go, and that's the exciting part, or the troubling the part that doesn't let you sleep at night. It's like you're figuring out a, a math equation in your head all day long, like, okay, what's going to happen? And, and they hopefully the characters kind of inform you what's going to happen, or, or something that you started to create has a life of its own, and you're surprised by it. That's when you know that, oh, this is alive. So. Um, you know, I teach fiction, and I always tell my, you know, my students who are anxious to know where is this going, what's going to happen. I said, if you know where it was going to, if you knew what was going to happen, then it wouldn't be interesting. No surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader is what they say. So, and then in terms of knowing when it ends, um, I usually have an idea about like the frame, like it's this big. It's, you know, so. It's more like a like a musical piece. Like, okay, it's time to stop. Yeah. So we're into an hour here. Is there any last question? Um, yeah. You haven't spoken about Teddy much, and he was an interesting mm. part of the story. Yeah. His evolution and opening yeah. up to us about what was going on with him, especially his education. Right. He was he was really difficult for me to write. I remember, you know, the white man. The Vermonter. Yeah. The Vermonter was, was um, and I, I mean, I, I, and I've heard criticism like, yeah, that we don't have enough of him, or he's unresolved, or, and um, and I I agree. <laughs> there were a lot more Teddy chapters that I ended up cutting out because, um, but um, it was always a challenge. I mean, I think of my neighbors. I mean, I, I live in. We're split down the middle politically, where I'm right on the border of New York State. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's half Republican, half Democrat. Um, so I tried my best to, to, I mean, he was somebody who would naturally be a Republican voter. He was in the military. Um, he would not necessarily be welcoming to, uh, foreigners, people that look different or have a different religion. So it was trying to make that, and he would not have had a good experience in Afghanistan with the culture. So there was always a question of which way he's going to go on this. And part of me doesn't know if it's realistic the way he ends up. And it all kind of hinges on one line in the book that I came up with and think, OK, that his service is to the chain of command. And now he's working at the monastery, and the abbot's the highest authority. So regardless of what he feels, he will listen to his superior. Do you believe it? Did you believe it? OK, good. <laughs> I don't know if I believe it. <laughs> um, 
But I also think there is something about Vermont where, you know, you are in a snowstorm, somebody's in trouble. People do, you know, they, they don't, you know, our neighbors, because we live in the rural place, we have to help each other. We have to deal with each other, you know, and we know where we stand politically and we still deal with each other. So that is a, maybe a uniquely, I mean, maybe I'm gilding the lily a little bit, but that does seem a uniquely Vermont thing. You know, I, I hear what you're saying about politics and, and somewhat stereotypical reactions to things, but yeah. I think a person con confronted with this kind of situation <clears throat> responds in a personal way, not a political way in a, in a, as much. I, I don't think, you know, somebody who's, who's a Republican. Yeah, I, 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 I'm yeah. sorry for framing it that okay, way. But I, I, really I think it's because the midterms are coming and so everything is coming. <laughs> well, for me, this is, has nothing to do with politics, this whole story, mm -hmm. and everything to do with doing what is right, mm -hmm. doing what a, a person should do for another person because of, it's the right thing to do. Right, and, 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 and you're, you're, you're completely right, and I'm sorry. Uh, no, don't be yeah. sorry. I, I understand. I think if you took a bunch of Somali refugees and, you know, plopped them someplace, horrible thing to say, people would react and, and they, they'd be against that. Yeah, from either, from wherever. From wherever. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but on a one-to-one, -one, yeah. once you know a person or you see that person, you see something dignified and valuable about that person right. and his or her situation. And to turn your back is, is not the most human or right. humane reaction. So I can see people from different um, political views and different religions and different uh, nationalities and different geographic areas even in the United States reacting yeah. out of goodness yeah. and right what is right that's naive of me maybe but no, I, I, don't I tell me that. otherwise i want to believe that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well yeah i'm sorry um bruno you started off the the story i thought he was going to be a bigger character um a little more contentious and some yeah. friction there and then he sort of Drops, yeah. yeah. Did, did we lose some of those chapters? And no, just a flaw of writing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's, there's, there's only so much that I thought I was able to sustain. Um, you're right, though. You're right. Yeah, Bruno does. He he does have his own cameo, and then he does disappear. He was he was a foil, I guess. I'm yeah. Uh, well, thanks for coming. It's been it's a great discussion.